Everyone has been muted. You can activate captions on your toolbar located at the bottom of the Zoom window, or you can use the URL we just posted in the chat box. Lastly, we do hope that you will share and tweet about this WID Town Hall and the very important issues that you all raised today. We would love it if you used hashtag Disability Disaster Alliance on various social media platforms. Uh, I think that's all the housekeeping, so let's get started. I'll turn it over to Marcy Roth, who will kick us off. Marcy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another gathering of the Global Alliance for Disaster Resource Acceleration. Over the past seven months, since we launched GADRA, we've brought together disability-led organizations, humanitarian funders, and allies from 69 countries with a shared commitment to support the leadership of and resources for local disability-led organizations and their disaster-impacted community before, during, and after disasters. GADRA is committed to disrupting the exclusion of disability-led organizations from humanitarian and humanitarian and relief and accelerating resources they need to support their community when it's needed most. Today, we are proud to pass the mic to some of our colleagues who are leading the global effort to center the experiences of Black disabled people during and after disasters. Our moderator for this important discussion is GADRA Founders Circle member Andrea Levant. Andrea and I have been partnering on operationalizing inclusion for many years and I've always admired her leadership. Andrea is the founder and president of Levant Consulting, LCI, a social impact communications firm that offers cutting edge corporate development and content marketing for brands and nonprofits. LCI's specialty is helping brands speak disability with confidence. As a communications consultant and inclusion specialist, Andrea has over a decade of experience working with programs that support youth and adults with disabilities and other underserved populations. She currently serves as the impact producer for Netflix's Oscar shortlisted feature film documentary, Crip Camp, where she is charged with leading the campaign's effort to promote understanding of disability as a social justice issue and build across lines of difference. Before we turn to Andrea, I'm pleased to welcome our guest speaker, another longtime partner who I've had the opportunity to collaborate with on key disability and disaster policy initiatives for many years. Curtis Brown has Homeland Security and Emergency Management experience at the federal, state, and local levels. He currently serves as the state coordinator, director of emergency management at the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. In 2018, he co-founded the Institute for Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management, IDIEM, a, a nonprofit organization dedicated to diversify the field of emergency management and promote the application of equitable practices to improve disaster outcomes and build community resilience for the most vulnerable communities. Curtis is recognized as a certified emergency manager. He serves on the Equitable Climate Resiliency Advisory Panel for the Institute for Building Technology and Safety and FEMA's Mitigation Framework Leadership Group. I'm excited to welcome Curtis and the Institute for Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management as our newest GADRA Founders Circle member. Welcome, Curtis. Thank you uh, so much, Marcy, for that wonderful introduction and uh, for all your, your friendship and your leadership uh, over many years uh, advocating for inclusive emergency management, addressing the needs of people with disabilities and operationalizing equity and inclusion. Uh, as Matt Marcy uh, said, my name is Curtis Brown. I serve as Director of Emergency Management here in Virginia, uh, the Department of Emergency Management and co-founder of the Institute for Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management. And it's really my pleasure to uh, make some opening comments for the Global Alliance for Disability Resource uh, Acceleration today. And for particularly this panel discussion, 
about the experiences of Black disabled people during and after disasters. This is a wonderful opportunity for a truly global and inclusive discussion. Uh, research focused on the correlation of race and disability status and disasters confirm clear and systemic biases and negative impacts against Black disabled people before, during, and after disasters. For instance, data related to the global COVID-19 pandemic has confirmed disproportionate impacts, uh, including higher cases and hospitalization rates and death rates. Uh, this is why discussions like we're having today are so critically important. The panels today are focused on having a conversation about preparing for, responding to, and recovery from di disasters centered through the experiences of those who best understand these issues. Black disabled people are the subject matter experts who should be empowered, included in insights leverage to make uh, sure, to ensure that disaster response agencies make drastic and systemic and sustainable changes to improve the outcomes of black disabled uh, people during disasters. It makes us all better as a society when we have inclusive emergency management practices and make sure that uh, our planning and our response and recovery uh, addresses the needs of everyone. Myself and other emergency management leaders greatly benefit from these discussions since they remove the need for assumptions and helps to directly identify gaps and issues. This conversation today demonstrates the power of diversity and inclusion and in prioritizing and, and prioritizing the needs of those disproportionately impacted. Uh, today, we highlight uh, one element of this important uh, discussion about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, looking at the needs of Black disabled people and their experiences in disasters. Uh, there are other data points that demonstrate the urgency of this moment and topic. Uh, persons with disabilities are more likely to be left behind or abandoned during evacuations and disasters, in many cases due, in due to inaccessible facilities and services and transportation systems. Uh, several studies show us that including the needs and the voices of persons with disabilities at all stages of disaster management process enhances our ability uh, to really be inclusive and meet the needs of everyone. All these data points demonstrate the intersection of race, color, ethnicity, and individuals with disabilities and disasters. Uh, as we continue to uh, move forward with the COVID-19 response, I hope we can learn the lessons that are needed to be learned um, to address these uh, clear gaps. Uh, we face the potential for more frequent and impactful natural disasters as well. Uh, that's why it's, it's urgently needed for us to hear these voices and to take actions now. Our emergency planning efforts should be inclusive, address the needs of people of color, and build resilience and preparation for future emergencies. Prioritizing marginalized people and integrating equity into all aspects of disasters uh, can occur if we make uh, diversity, equity, inclusion a foundational goal and responsibility of emergency management, prioritize at-risk populations in all planning and funding programs in all aspects of emergency management, and integrate and empower and leverage those uh, who experience inequities on a daily basis. Uh, in closing, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's session and thank all the panelists for the great work uh, that they do and the moderators as well uh, for all the viewers who are participating in the discussion today and listening who will take the information and turn it into actionable, change, uh, actionable uh, changes to make impact all over the globe. Really thank you for all that you do as well. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it back over. Uh, to to the moderators. And again, thank you for the opportunity to make some comments today. Thank you so much, Curtis. Thanks for being here. This is Andrea Levant, and I am going to um, provide an image description before we move forward. So I'm sitting in my living room with a teal couch behind me and variety of uh, kind of spring-like decorations. I am wearing a kind of um, marigold colored shirt. Um, you can't see it, uh, what, what it says in the camera, but it says um, advocate like truth, innovate like walker, 
dream like Tubman and lead like Douglas. I am I have a gold chain around my neck I'm wearing some um, African uh, orange earrings that I got from Ghana. I'm wearing uh, my my cat eye black glasses, curly um, shoulder length hair, and my skin is a deep caramel brown. Um, so <laughs> thanks so much. So, super excited to um, begin this conversation today. Thanks um, to everyone uh, within Gadra for having me and, and Marcy in particular. So let's get started. I would, I'm going to begin with providing a, um, an introduction of each of the panelists that we have with us today. And then we will jump right into questions. So first person um, that we have is Anita Cameron. Anita is the Director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet. As a Black disabled lesbian, Anita has dealt with racism, sexism, ableism, and homophobia, sometimes com combinations of these. She has used her experience of discrimination and her unique intersectional perspective to promote understanding among different groups of disenfranchised people and increase social justice among those fighting for social justice. Then we have Diko Yusuf, who is a high school literature teacher in Nigeria and project coordinator at the Special Needs Initiative for Growth, located in Northern Nigeria. Yusuf became more involved with advocacy in 2019 during his year of national service when he joined a community development service group for sustainable development goals. Then we have Leroy Moore, who is the founder of Crip Hop Nation and has been a key member of Poor Magazine since the 1990s. Moore's work with Poor Magazine began with his column, Illin and Chillin. He went on to become a founding member of Poor Magazine's Homefulness and Decolonize Academy. Moore is also one of the founding members of National Black Disability, an activist whose work centers around police brutality against people with disabilities. Next, we have Vivian Isabor, who has run awareness sessions and advocated on platforms such as BBC, Mental Health Today and Mind since being diagnosed with ADHD in her early 20s. Isabor is a trainee clinical associate in psychology, currently studying part-time at UCL and working with individuals with complex emotion needs in East London. She is also a founder of ADHD Babes the first support group for Black women and, non, and Black non-binary people with ADHD, where she is the Director of Community Outreach and Wellbeing. And finally, we have Kaman Wasu, who is the Treasurer at PNG Assembly of Disabled Persons and Chairman at PNG Blind Union in Papua New Guinea. Kaman has facilitated systemic advocacy trainings on disability inclusion since 2018. During Kaman's trainings, people with disabilities gather to partake in formal and informal advocacy activities. Kaman also runs focus group discussions regarding topics such as utilizing mainstream media for advocacy. So we have a pretty powerful panel today and would like to get started. So I am going to ask a question and then um, for the sake of access, if each of you panelists can turn on your cameras when you're speaking and then turn them off, that would be after you're finished, that would be wonderful. So the first question I have is actually for all of you. And that is just if you can tell us a little more about yourself and how COVID-19 and disasters 
impact you and your communities. And um, if we can begin with Kaman, that would be great. Sorry, I'm navigating uh, using my screen reader to unmute my audio and my video, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I have, uh, I am in a country called Papua New Guinea, which is north of Australia, uh, within the Pacific uh, region. So, Basically, my country is pretty much a small country um, with 8 million population, 8 million plus population. And it's a developing country. So um, when the COVID-19 strike, I am also doing a lot of voluntary work, which I don't get paid. So I pretty much uh, do a lot of volunteer stuff to sustain myself uh, in the urban setting. So uh, when COVID-19 strike uh, in, 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 in Papua New Guinea, uh, basically when we saw the, the news about how coronavirus strike the Chinese and then went out, the government was not really serious about this until when it increased and then the government decided to impose a total shutdown for three months. And during the time, most of our, uh, our disabled persons, including myself, we depend entirely on the informal sector uh, to sustain ourselves. So it was really a struggling moment for us. And, because our country, my country is a developing country, we depend on each other. And our family bondage is very strong. The family uh, within the household gets to, you know, support each other to sustain ourselves. So when the government imposed a shutdown period for three months, uh, it did not take into consideration how we will survive throughout the process of, throughout the period of shutdown. So it was really a struggling moment for myself, a specific, specifically a person with disability. So it was, I really had to uh, source other options to sustain myself. So I depended, I depend, I was depending entirely on my family to the funds means and way for me to sustain myself. So it was really, a struggling moment for myself uh, because I depend entirely on the informal sector and also doing a lot of voluntary work just to, you know, bring something back to my family. So it was a struggling moment for me during the time that the government imposed uh, three months shutdown when 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 there was a first case registered in in Papua New Guinea. So that's my experience. So. Uh, when COVID-19 strike. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anita, can you tell us more about yourself and how COVID-19 and disasters impact you and your communities? Hello, my name's Anita Cameron. I'm the Director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet. Um, quick image description, um, caramel colored skin, black woman with long locks, um, wearing a pink shirt that says not yet yet, which is um, my organization. Um, one thing I don't think it was made clear about me um, in this is that I have um, a, a disaster and emergency um, planning experience. Um, I'm what's known as a CERT, which is Community Emergency Response Team. Um, started that out in Washington, DC and um, helped to organize the first CERT um, class for people with disabilities um, here in Rochester, New York. I then went to Denver 
and joined their CERT and then became a CERT instructor, um, the first um, legally blind in, uh, instructor for the state of Colorado, and then became um, a, a program manager and an amateur radio operator. And I've had some experiences in real life um, uh, disasters and real life actual um, exercises, um, both national, um, state and local. Um, when COVID hit, um, I immediately began to notice the impact on the Black community and the disability community. Um, and as I saw the impact and saw that um, often we were not served, we were, um, you know, dying um, at faster and higher rates and things. Um, I, be, I then began to write um, about that subject um, in the context uh, of my job. Um, as I said, again, I'm director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet. Not Dead Yet is a disability organization that is um, opposed to and fights against um, met, uh, disability discrimination in medicine, uh, medical uh, rationing, healthcare rationing, euthanasia, and um, doctor assisted suicide. And so I. I saw where in, in that context, um, especially as um, proponents of assisted suicide began um, making the moves to list COVID-19 as a uh, terminal illness and push for people to um, apply for assisted suicide, uh, using COVID as that response. And I saw that as really dangerous. I saw the, the medical rationing that was going on. It was really, really scared um, for my community. We all have heard the story of uh, Michael Hickson, um, a gentleman from Texas who happened to be black and disabled and how he was denied it. COVID-19 treatment specifically because he was disabled um, and placed into hospice and allowed to die. And that was chilling, that frightened me. And so um, I've been, you know, keeping close tabs on, you know, as we're living through COVID mm -hmm. and seeing its impact on Black community, Native American, you know, uh, Indigenous community, um, Latina community, and particularly the disability community, it's scary. Um, and I'm still watching. And people with disabilities, we are fighting still for basic resources and fighting to be included, you know, in in governmental things and in, in, in funding, you know, and all of that. So I, I'm, I am definitely keeping aware. Um, as I said, I've done some writing for this for Not Dead Yet and just on my own. It's frightening um, and I am, but I'm grateful for those of us disability activists out here really pushing for and fighting for us to be in, included, you know, in things like the, the vaccination lineups and things of that nature. So I think I'll stop right here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amita. Deco, can you share a little? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Diko Yusuf, and I'm from Nigeria, Kaduna State, Nigeria, specifically, northern Nigeria, that is. Um, I'm a teacher, as you said, and um, uh, I understand I have an accent, but it kind of depends because I normally don't read. I use audiobooks to read, so it affects the way I speak. And also the reason why I do use audiobooks is because I am visually impaired as well. So I, I have very low vision. Um, 
for the impact of the COVID-19, you know, because I was teaching at a school, um, in March last year, the government shut down everything, really no movement at all, when it came, became very apparent that the COVID-19 had landed in Nigeria. So they wanted to kind of um, limit the damage that the virus, you know, wreaked in the, or the, the chaos wreaked in, in the country. And one thing that did strike almost immediately, and I hear Anita speak of having an, an instant impact, I kind of felt that as well, because I was teaching at a school and then schools were shut down. And it's a private school, so private owners of such schools cannot keep paying salaries. And, and something that also come and said. So suddenly the income that you're having is, is stopped, is cut short, it, it stopped. <laughs> and I use a, an eye drop for my eye condition to r reduce the intraocular pressure so that um, my vision is clearer throughout the day. I use it once in the morning and once uh, in the evening. And when I went to get the um, I, I drop, I was, I, I was shocked that the price had actually tripled. Now, not doubled, it tripled um, almost overnight. And part of the reason is because drugs in general, especially drugs, skyrocketed. Their prices just increased astronomically. So a drug that you would normally get for a certain price would be twice or three times the amount that you would get it. Um, and that, that really, struck a blow and, and, and it struck a chord sorry and and it, it kept going on with other things as well so you know everyday items that you would find at a market and things that weren't even imported because this was the thing that was said that drugs were actually imported from other countries and there was an interruption in the supply chains so what it kind of meant was that um, certain things were not coming in as readily and they were not available as readily as you would have them um, so it, it became quite apparent that it was going to be really rough, a rough road ahead. And, and it was for seven months, we didn't receive any salary because, you know, schools were not opened even when other sectors reopened because, you know, managing schools is quite difficult. Um, they have to make sure that everything was there. So only when school was um, reopened around uh, September, October, and then it was closed again, <laughs> unfortunately for us, but only recently reopened. However, um, I think um, so far, really, we, we, we have, in terms of um, sustaining oneself, and I hear Carmen speaking from Papua New Guinea, and I can relate a lot to what he was saying. You have to rely on the benevolence of your family members, which at, at a certain point I just had to, because there was no stream of income coming in. And yeah. So really, it's more about resources that were not coming in to sustain myself, my needs. But, you know, I have family luckily around and a community as a community, the way we live in Nigeria usually is, you know, the people around you also chip in if you're going through tough times. So we saw a lot of that really in Nigeria. It, 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 it brought people closer together, but also there, there, there was the kind of... Um, um, you know, having to cope with a very difficult situation that most people went through. So I think that's that's mostly it for um, my experiences really so far in the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Thank you for sharing, Dikto. Uh, next we'll have um, Vivian, if you can share a little bit about yourself and how um, COVID-19 and disasters impact your communities. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, so I guess for me personally, um, I lost a lot of my routine, uh, which included, you know, go, being able to be outside, like act, outdoor activities. I used to attend a lot of kind of galleries and events. Um, yeah, loads of social events that would help break up my days um, and also was a bit of escapism um, having ADHD my thoughts are kind of constantly racing so having moments of time where there was a break um, was really useful for me so losing out on that I think was really difficult um, as well as that I was finishing uni at the start of uh, the pandemic so everything moved online 
So kind of studying, being able to concentrate on lectures, um, that was extremely difficult. So I tried to go back to my ADHD clinic, um, but wasn't able to because the line was, yeah, the waiting list was way too long. Um, I still haven't heard back from them and that was back, um, that was back in summer. Um, so yeah, the lack of access to services um, is, a, is a really big difficulty. Um, as well as that, remembering dates, I think the, the lack of kind of change and the, the daily, you know, not being able to go outside and have different things to break things up has meant um, the days are blurring into one. Um, and it's made it difficult to organize um, a difficulty uh, that some people refer to as time blindness has gotten worse um, because there's no there's no breaks. Everything just feels very flat. Um, and in, in terms of our community, a lot of people from the black community with ADHD um, have spoken about not being able to access services. ADHD services in the UK are already stretched. They, they don't have enough resources. Um, and now during the pandemic, a lot of people's difficulties have, you, you can see it a lot more, it's been maximized because we've lost out on our routine, we've lost out on our support networks um, and the things that would help us manage. So people are experiencing it a lot more and seeking help um, from a system that already doesn't have a lot of resources in the first place. Um, and then things like feeling isolated, so not actually having, you know, the your community around you has meant loads of people have been seeking that community online. Um, so our group has grown a lot in the last six months because people are seeking that space to kind of be around people, to relate to people, to just not feel isolated. Um, yeah, and I think the, the lack of services was already bad, but during during this kind of disaster and this this COVID-19 period, it's, it's gotten a lot worse, um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. And next we have Leroy. Hello. I just got my video. Hello, Leroy Moore here. I'm sitting in my living room with a purple shirt on. Um, Salt and pepper here, and mustache beard, and I like I like to take it on an international stage because I is we, so there's no story without we, and you know of course people with disabilities we got the largest um, minority group in the world, and in disaster this is the same story. We've been here before, it's just bigger. You know, we can look at Hurricane Katrina, we can look at the earthquake in Puerto Rico, we can look at, you know, what's happening in Haiti. Same story. It's the story is that people with disabilities are left out and are killed in hospitals by police. And we are the last ones to to get any kind of services or any kind of um, vaccines if we need it. And that's because of our institutions and our laws don't go for it enough. Our laws are not implemented, so it's a piece of paper. And our um, services are not dedicated to us every every time we get into a budget situation our services are cut so it, it makes sense that in emergency situations it happens over and over again that we are killed by police and that we are we are the last ones to be um thought of it's the same story is this is this now it's, it's a bigger pandemic and everybody dealing with it. You know, in New Orleans, it was poor people of color that dealt with it. And white wealthy people didn't, didn't see it. You know, we had our president, George Bush, that flew over it and looked out the window. So it's, 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 it's nothing new in this world is left behind. 
want to say, you know, Should we, it should be drastically changed how we do school. You know, now it should be like a teacher in an empty room and everybody has computer at home. Because we can't go back to what's normal. And we, we see that when schools in New York open up, they had to close two days after we got people working on COVID. So it's, you know, it's so, it's so frustrating that the system won't change, you know, and, and because it won't change, we're going to continue having the, the same situation, you know, the same, you know, emergency that's going to happen next year, two years or three years ago, people with disabilities are going to need at, at the bottom again. So, you know, if, if we don't learn and we, we don't do radical changes to the system and we have to get used to, you know, this situation happening over and over again with a we, not an I, because, you know, this happens in different countries for people with disabilities. Okay, thank you so much, Leroy. This is Andrea. Um, so I want to, and I feel like, you know, this is alluded to, and uh, well, not even just alluded to, but quite honestly, um, um, each of you spoke about this a little bit um, with regard to um, COVID-19. But in, in general, if you can give us um, a, a broader perspective on the ways that that you understand and know Black disabled people to experience racism and ableism before, during, and after, and after disasters. Um, and so I'm going to direct that to, um, in this order, Anita, Leroy, and then Kaman. So again, the question is, in what ways do Black disabled people experience racism and ableism before, during, and after disasters? Hi, this is Anita. One, in the first place, we aren't even thought of, okay? We're not even thought of before, during, you know, uh, or after disasters. Um, we're not thought of by um, local government, um, state government. Um, our, our communities are, are not heard from. Um, often when we try to advocate for our communities, we're kind of pushed away, kind of uh, dismissed. Um, as we know, and particularly um, in the disability community, I mean, Black folks, we we do tend to be poor. Um, when we're disabled, we tend to be poor. We also tend to have a lack of access um, to um, information and other resources. Um, you know, uh, even you know, compared to other uh, groups of disabled folks. And so what ends up happening is, as we see, you know, the disability community itself is rarely if ever, you know, thought of um, before, during and after disasters. Um, and that shows up in silliness like, um, you know, oh, have disabled people have paratransit, um, help them to evacuate. Really? Okay. Um, 
oftentimes, you know, if we have to evacuate uh, because, you know, we're poor and tend to be poor, we often can't. We often have no choice but to shelter in place. Um, in disasters, people with disabilities lose, we die unnecessarily. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in, in so many other ways. And then after disasters, you know, our communities were the last to, um, you know, to, to go through the, to be cleaned up, if you will. You know, we're the last to, you know, we're, we're there, I mean, think about it. I mean, if you think about Hurricane Katrina and think about that, there's still parts of New Orleans, you know, where the houses are still devastated and whatnot from Hurricane Katrina. Okay, and we're talking like fifteen, sixteen years ago. So, um, you know, that that that's another way um, that we're not, you know, that we're not even thought of that where the um, Racism and ableism, you know, uh, um, happens, and so um, we're not listened to by the, you know, by these commissions, you know, by the, the, you know, the city government planning or all of that. They just don't consult us. Um, you know, they, as far as disabled, I mean, I think a lot of folks think that, that we have to do stuff for disabled. And so um, people don't want to listen to us when we're telling, you know, about our problems and the things that impact our communities. Um, different people kind of look, you know, at it as, you know, us kind of wanting handouts or, or sympathies and not um, us giving advice on what you can do to help our communities, you know, and, um, and, and how, how to help, how to help us. And so that's just one of the few ways that racism and ableism uh, persists. It seems as if, you know, especially if we're disabled, it's almost as if um, we can't you can't think for yourself. So we're going to have to think for you and do for you instead of listening to us um, tell you what we need and how you can better help help our communities. And uh, there's just so much more, but just that whole thing of um, we're not valued as people in a community. So hey, people don't want to listen to us. Um, and that's, uh, that's sad. It's something that I've been trying to work to change for as long as I've been, you know, volunteering in this field, which has been since 2005, uh, um, we still have a lot of um, hearts and minds to change because as long as, as those in charge, if you will, think that um, we don't have anything valuable to offer, um, you know, then that's what it's going to be. Another thing is, while we deserve to be rescued, you know, and all of that, this right to rescue, um, we also deserve to be the ones helping our communities out, being on those commissions, um, being part, you know, um, of, of disaster planning, you know, and all of that. And uh, Often, especially if you're disabled, people don't want to listen to us. I've served on those, you know, on, on some of those, and um, often it, it's very, very difficult to get those in charge to to listen and to follow up on on our suggestions. And I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Leroy, can you share with us in what ways do Black disabled people experience racism and ableism before, during, and after disasters? Oh, you know, I mean, that's, that's a whole book. I mean, you can't book about that. But um, 
basically black disabled people, you know, have no um, national voice. You know, I, I belong to the National Black Disability Coalition. I think it's the only national organization for black disabled people. And the BACP has no clue about disability. The Urban League has no clue about disability. You know, so um, so if you if you don't have an organization, a national organization that represents you, yeah, of course it's gonna be racism and ableism and not me. You know, so that's that's number one. So can you imagine if black disabled people can come home and come home and you know start working for these laws not non profit non organizers and come home to the black community. He can't come home now because there's no foundation. And, then, and, and because of that, um, situations like this continues to happen. You know, um, Martin Luther King said, I can't follow you if you're not going my way. You know, and, and that's, and that's, you know, I'm 53 years old. I've been, you know, doing race and disability stuff since the 80s. And although it's gotten a, a little bit better, it's still, it's still not at, at a level where we can force policy, we can force the manifestation, we can force our, our community, you know, our Black community to, to not be ableist, you know, we can force our disabled community to face their racism. But that that's gonna happen when um, a, a group, a strong group of us get together as an organization and, and um, force that to happen. You know, um, yeah, I mean, all of these, you know, now, now we have, you know, racial justice on the on the national agenda, you know, from our president, vice president, but still, you know, no way he's talking about black disabled issues. So so you know my my question is is, is that, you know, in fifty three are we are we gonna talk about it again in another fifty three years and say, oh, there's no organization? You know, sometimes you have to make a sacrifice. And sometimes you have sacrifices it's like I, I have to work with in my community to make sure that there's a foundation for the next generation. So, you know, that's a question. Are, are, are we going to make that sacrifice? Or are we going to continue working at other places and saying that the Black community does not recognize disability. Of course they don't because there's no there's no organization there. There's no um, education there. You know, we we, we are um, we are into these nonprofit uh, disabled organizations that really don't speak to black disabled people. So thank you. Thank you so much, Leroy. And um, the last for this question, come on. In what ways did Black disabled people experience racism and ableism before, during, and after disasters? Uh, yeah. I think for myself, uh, specifically coming from a country which is dominated by uh, black people. Uh, Papua New Guinea is located in the north of Australia. It's a Pacific country, Pacific Island country. Uh, I see that um, uh, during the during the time of uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, um, because of the support that the government government of Papua New Guinea needed, a lot of uh, international donor agencies. And uh, like uh, the UN, and and uh, 
a lot of donor agencies were coming in, uh, but they forgot about all about consulting with persons with disabilities and also uh, the mandated uh, DPO who represents persons with disabilities too, you know, to have discussions with them to how see how the preparedness and the response should be like. And even the government of uh, my country, uh, also the government of my country also, you know, decided to come up with a pandemic act just within one month and just imagine there was no consultation with persons with disabilities or representation of persons with disabilities. But because of a lot of money from international donors, which they wanted to tick their boxes, uh, you know, so in order for them to tick their boxes because of funding that will support the government to respond to COVID-19, but uh, because of that, there was no inclusion and automatically it caused, uh, you know, racism and segregation within persons with disabilities participation in, in, in a decision making process in terms of the follow, development of, you know, guidelines and processes systems to to comply with uh, the new new normal uh, in light of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, I saw a lot of, and even also during, uh, also during <clears throat> the, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the government, uh, the government came up with uh, the new, um, the new normal protocols like, uh, you know, uh, washing your hands 20 minutes and uh, also maintain social distancing and uh, this new protocols was you know uh, it was mandatory for everyone to comply with if you are moving around in public you know spaces and things like that but it was not really capturing disability inclusion in in the new protocols that they the government has developed so uh, because of persons with disabilities were not consulted to participate so that their voice can be captured in terms of development of the you know policies and guidelines systems so basically uh, persons with disabilities were missing out uh, one i've men made mention of because of funding the international donors have came on board to support the government of you know papua new guinea but they forgot all about persons with disabilities and they went on to develop you know systems and processes just to tick their boxes and you know get funding to come through but the persons with disabilities were missing out so for preparedness and response also uh, we were not being consulted being part of the decision making process so when we were not being part of already created the segregation and you know it, it also uh, it also created uh, discrimination and racism within the system and the processes so thank you Thank you so much. And I know we are running short on time. So I have a question that I want to um, direct towards Diko, uh, Diko and uh, Vivian, and then we will conclude. So the question is, you know, we know that institutional racism is a global issue that differently affects local communities. In what ways does institutional racism and ableism influence the disaster cycle? And we'll start with Diko. Okay, um, so um, in terms of like um, institutional racism, as you've spoken, I, I suppose I'm speaking as a Nigerian and as a country dominated by black people. So kind of uh, the experiences of um, my personal experience as a person with disability and also in, in considering um, the fact that um, there is a lot of ableism in, in, within the society. It, it goes back to really, for me at least, it goes back to that um, major idea of where we're having a very little access to employment and participation in politics and, and civic policy. You know, and you look at the cabinet in Nigeria for people who make the decisions, who call the shots, you find that it, 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 it's very, it's not representative at all really of, of persons with disability. I think there's only one 
person who has a disability in 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 in, in the in the whole um, Senate or something. So I think it, it it just goes back to that. If you look at the the institutions that represent Nigerians and Nigeria as a whole, it it, it doesn't really it, it isn't that reflective of, of of the experiences or people who can at least empathize with the position of persons with disabilities like myself and many other people in Nigeria who have or who are living with different forms of disability. So I think, yeah, um, in terms of institutional uh, racism or at least a kind of lack of representation, um, it's very palpable here. But there are, I should say this, uh, lastly, there are, there seems to be a great deal of improvement in terms of inclusion and also um, policies that are directed at including the lives of persons with disabilities. I have noticed this in Nigeria and hopefully it's something that will continue. And I think with these kinds of conversations, we can drive the change that we want to see. So thank you very much. I know we're running short on time. I had to put my um, answer short. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, and finally, Vivian. Thank you. Um, so, I think there's a there's a lot of things that contribute to the kind of disaster cycle, especially um, for Black people within Britain. So I'm from Britain, um, England, and North London to be specific. And within um, within well within this society, mental health, physical health, within education, um, and even within politics, um, Black people are discriminated against um, Black and Asian and other minority groups, um, but specifically um, Black people, especially within mental health services, have worse outcomes than their white counterparts. So I think that exists already as a difficulty. Um, and then when you look specifically at things like ADHD, um, that ADHD being seen as an invisible condition means that people, people overlook it. Um, people don't necessarily understand what it means, especially within um, our community so often people grow up not knowing um, and then considering the fact that ADHD is underdiagnosed in a lot of groups um, I think the fact that you know within our society for example black women aren't believed when um, they express pain um, during childbirth I think that kind of rhetoric of not understanding pain and cultural competence means that our experiences aren't necessarily believed by professionals, which I think adds on to the fact that a lot of black women are diagnosed later on in life. Um, so a lot of the people within our group, they've been diagnosed up to their early 20s, with people being diagnosed right up to um, their mid 40s. Um, and that's kind of a combination of being a woman and being black. Um, I guess in terms of how, how it now becomes a cycle, I think us not being um, us being underdiagnosed and not being given the support and the treatment that we need means that our, we're not getting the support we need to kind of improve our quality of life. So that affects our employment prospects, that affects our mood and our mental health. Um, it goes on to affect our physical health and our relationship and just our overall quality of life. So if we're already going through those things and then you put, you know, a huge pandemic on top of that, that it's going to maximize and, and multiply the problem um, and it's going and we don't have the resources and the tools to manage that because we haven't been we haven't we don't have access to these services we don't have access to the support so i think it works in a cycle where we're already disadvantaged and then yeah the disaster put on top of that makes life harder and then trying to recover from that again with the lack of access to services the lack of understanding the lack of cultural competence and knowing what adhd looks like within um, you know, the black community or within uh, minority groups means that there's a disconnect and we're kind of forced to get through it together as, as a community and to kind of lean on, on one another's strengths, which is a great thing and we're, we're resilient and we're surviving, but we need more than that. It needs to be responded to with something that is concrete and, you know, something that's delivered to us, um, for us. Uh, yeah, so I'll try and keep it short like that. All such powerful um, commentary and, and truth. Thank you all so much. We are over time. And to Leroy's point earlier, this could, could oh my goodness, we could go on forever and ever um, around this topic. So thanks, um, hopefully, for what will be the, be, that is the beginning of a conversation. 
Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to um, each of our panelists, to Anita Cameron, to Leroy Moore, to Diko Youssef, um, Vivian Isabor, and to Kaman Wasup. Um, and then we also um, want to thank our um, Curtis Brown, who led us out in the beginning. Um, you can learn more about joining GADRA on the WID website, www.wid.org, W-I-D. And please be on the lookout for more information on the next GADRA event, which will be held on May 20th. Thank you all so much. Thank you.